Well, hello there, you scrub lords, and welcome back to Devblog Chats, the series which comes only once per year. Today, we're going to be talking about Israel's chariot of God, Merkava. The design of Merkava goes back to soon after the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Originally, as we discussed in our last Devblog episode on the Shot Kal, Israel had wanted to secure chieftains from Britain, much like they had gotten centurions previously. However, this was not to pass. As the British government in 1969 cancelled any weapon shipments to Israel and placed an embargo on the country, and by extension, ended any potential involvement of the British government in Israeli tank design. This prompted the Israelis to look far more seriously into domestic tank development, and this would turn out to be a most fortuitous decision for them as the Israelis got to work designing their own vehicle specifically tailored to their needs, and without any British help in the matter, either. In addition, according to a report made by the U.S. Congressional Research Services in 2005, the Israelis managed to secure over $200 million in funding for the development of their new tank from the U.S. government, which in 1979 dollars would be equivalent to about $691 million in 2018 currency. This vehicle would become known as Merkava, or Chariot. The first prototype showed up in 1974, and it drew heavily from lessons learned during the Yom Kippur War. This meant that there was a great emphasis on protection and the survivability of the tank's crew. It's important to remember here that Israel's total landmass and population is smaller than the entire People's Republic of California. So keeping your tankers alive when there are rather few of them in the first place becomes quite important. The prototypes underwent modification and testing at the brand new Tel Hashomer Ordnance Depot, which was built specifically for Merkava. After some development, the Merkava Mark I was ready for production in 1977 and was made public in May of that year. Acceptance into service was made official by the Israeli Defense Forces in December of 1978. Production and upgrades were contracted out to the Mantak Arsenal along with the IDF Ordnance Corps and other smaller contractors. Systems integration, such as weapons and optical systems, were performed by Israeli Military Industries, or IMI. Now, the design of Merkava is very unlike most other MBTs. As I mentioned earlier, there was a great emphasis on survivability for the crew and its passengers. And yes, I said passengers. The main point of entry on a Merkava is a heavily armored split-hatch door mounted on the rear of the vehicle. The fighting compartment was designed to be roomy and could fit up to four fully equipped or eight lightly equipped soldiers. However, this is rarely done as carrying troops into battle tends to limit the vehicle's tactical flexibility and is really only useful in urban environments such as those encountered during Israeli operations in Lebanon in 1982. There is also a version of the vehicle that was modified into a tank ambulance, which even had life support equipment and room for several wounded personnel on stretchers at the cost of reduced ammunition capacity for the main gun. This proved successful enough during testing for one tank ambulance per battalion to be built and issued. In order to create this interior space, however, Merkava's engine had to be relocated to the front of the vehicle, which also improves the survivability by introducing a solid block of engine compartment directly in the path of incoming fire. Its turret is also designed to provide, at least on the early versions, the smallest profile possible to incoming fire, meaning that in a hold-down position, the Merkava can be a tough target to hit, let alone put down. Another design aspect of Merkava is the drivetrain and tracks of the vehicle are directly inspired by British Centurions, which they had been using for quite some time under the name Schott. However, instead of directly copying the Centurion's horseman suspension system, where two road wheels are connected to a single bogey which bolts onto the side, each individual road wheel is its own self-contained suspension unit with an arm and a heavy coil spring that bolts onto the side. This is supposed to give Merkava better cross-country performance over rocky terrain, as well as making maintenance of the suspension very easy since if a single wheel is damaged, you don't lose two like you would on a horseman suspension system. In addition, the Merkava's engine compartment is designed to allow for easy replacement of its power pack. The tank, however, is not without its issues. The Merkava is a heavy girl, weighing in at a base weight of 60 tons combat loaded. All of this weight is only powered by a 900 horsepower engine, giving it an awful power-to-weight ratio of only 15 horsepower per ton, meaning that the Merkava is one of the slower main battle tanks out there with a top speed of only 46 kilometers per hour forwards and 8 backwards, meaning that this vehicle is not for those looking for a fast mobile flanker. Rather, its playstyle will likely be far more defensive, like Chieftains, for example. In addition, early versions of the Merkava only featured spaced rolled homogeneous steel armor, they did not feature Nera composites to help against heat projectiles. Now that we understand its design, let's discuss its variants. As we already know, the version coming to War Thunder is the Merkava Mark I. 
This features a 900 horsepower diesel engine built in Israel by Erdan Industries. Its main armament is the 105mm M68 rifled gun. I was unable to determine, however, in the limited time I had to write this script, whether these guns were manufactured directly in Israel or if they were shipped in from the US. My guess is that it's a little of both. If any of you have further information on this topic, please leave a comment down below. Secondary armaments consists of two M240 Bravo 7.62mm machine guns, also known as FN mags, and a third M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun mounted in line with the main gun for extra ducca. In addition, an external 60mm mortar was fitted to the vehicle which could be fired from inside the hull. However, in order to reload it, the operator would have to leave the protection of the vehicle and thereby expose himself. Total production of the Mark I comes out to about 250 units. After his baptism of fire in Lebanon, a few changes were made to the Mark I, including the relocation of the mortar to a more remote position, and the discovery of a weak point on the rear of the turret which caused a shot trap with RPGs that would completely jam the turret. This was fixed by the addition of chain netting which would shred or detonate RPGs prematurely before they reached the main armor. This chain armor is the primary way to determine whether you're looking at an early or a late Mark I. The Mark II retained the 105mm gun and was first produced in April of 1983, incorporating many of the lessons learned during the fighting in Lebanon. A great emphasis was placed on improving the vehicle's survivability in urban environments. The shot trap issue previously mentioned was addressed, and a big change was the modification of the 60mm mortar to allow it to be reloaded and fired from within the vehicle without exposing the operator. Protection of both the Mark I and the Mark II consisted of spaced rolled homogeneous steel armor. The transmission was made fully automatic and was made more efficient along with an increased fuel capacity. The fire control systems received a major upgrade which took into account many more factors than previously, as well as image intensifiers and thermographic sensors getting a tune-up. The Merkava Mark II saw much more numerous production at around 580 units, with its production ending in around 1989. In addition, Merkava Mark II saw further development into three distinct sub-variants. The Mark IIb received refined thermal optics and further improvements to the fire control system. The Mark IIc received increased armor protection of the turret roof, both to protect against air attack and from overhead attacks in urban environments such as RPGs fired from rooftops. And the Mark IId featured the addition of a modular composite armor package for easier maintenance and repair. This armor array is still highly classified by the Israeli government, and understandably so. Merkava Mark III was a substantial departure from the earlier variants and was introduced in December of 1989, with its total production of 780 units running up to 2002 from no less than 16 different subcontractors, including, ironically enough, Russian military industries, who helped design the KMT-4 and KMT-5 mine-clearing dozers, along with the ABK-3 dozer blade module meaning that the Russians actually have a bigger claim to the Merkava than the British do. The two big improvements made with the Mark III was the IMI-produced 120mm smoothbore gun that was built to fire more intelligent ammunition, such as the Lahat ATGM, making it one of the few vehicles in the West to fire a gun-launched ATGM on a main battle tank. This missile was also tested on a German Leopard 2A4, but was not adopted for use. In addition, its mobility got a big upgrade in the form of a new 1200 horsepower MTU turbo diesel engine, along with a brand new transmission. This gave a massive performance boost and increased the cruising speed to 60 km per hour. In addition, a new turret drive was added which allowed for the turret to better track targets while on the move. Other small improvements followed throughout the 90s. One of them, known as the Mark III BAZ, was a set of improvements which introduced a new composite armor array and upgraded a number of FCS-related systems to allow for tracking and engaging multiple moving targets while moving the vehicle. Other improvements were made to the NBC protection system and the introduction of one of the best tank air conditioning systems out there. The Mark III Dordalette, or Mark III D, introduced improvements that would become standard on the Mark IV in the early 2000s including new Caterpillar tracks and the Raphael Overhead Weapon Station, or ROSE, which allowed the use of a remotely controlled turret-mounted machine gun. This brings us to the Israeli's ultimate version of the Merkava, the Mark IV, which began development in 1999. It was first revealed to the public in a Bamakhane publication from October 2004 and put into service that same year. Unlike the previous Marks, the production of the tank was not to exceed its predecessors, with only 260 being delivered as of 2012 with a further estimated 300 vehicles to be delivered by 2030. 
These incorporated modifications previously seen on the Mark III BAZ and Dor Dalet, including the Mark III-D's protection suite. The first major addition to the Mark IV was the interesting addition of a brand new MG253 120mm smoothbore gun, which featured brand new AP FSDS ammunition and other improved ammunition types. In addition, the 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the barrels were equipped with high explosive bullets. Because why not? The Mark IV also saw further improvements of the modular armor package that gives the later variants of the Merkava their distinct look. The fire control systems were upgraded to the L Op Knight Mark IV, which allows the Merkava to engage air threats like anti tank helicopters. This was coupled with the Elbit battle management system to help data link the Mark IV into friendly assets and gain increased situational awareness on the battlefield. The protection was increased in vulnerable areas to help in urban environments, and a V-shape was applied to the hull to better deflect blasts from landmines and IEDs. Ammunition protection also increased dramatically by giving fireproof protection to each individual round, along with the removal of all ammunition from the turret. The vehicle was also equipped with a heat deflection system to help confuse enemy thermals. New tracks were developed, which increased their durability and handling even more in very rough terrain encountered in the northern half of the country. The most recent and substantial upgrade, however, is the addition of the Trophy Active Protection System, which is responsible for intercepting and destroying enemy anti-tank missiles before they even reach the vehicle. This system has also recently been adopted for the U.S.'s newest M1A2C main battle tank. If the U.S. is adopting this system, it shows that it must be extremely effective and proven. And with that, we will close the development history of the Merkava main battle tank. I'm hoping that this more extensive development video will help cover future variants of the Merkava that we can potentially see in-game. In addition, I wanted to give a shout out to Averick, who has helped me immensely with some of the research and with some of my terrible pronunciation of Hebrew. And you guys should definitely go and check out his channel, he has got some truly amazing stuff on there. Links in the video description. The story of the Merkava and its variants is a fascinating subject. And despite the 18-page long thread of stupidity on the forums regarding the Merkava would tell you, there is zero relation between the British government and its companies and Merkava as a whole. In fact, the only thing remotely British about this tank was the drivetrain and the early tracks being derived, notice I didn't say copied, from the Centurion. Its defensive role and focus on survivability is hardly something unique among Western main battle tanks, but especially considering Israel's geopolitical situation, it's not hard to see why they took the development route that they did. As for its implementation into War Thunder, the fact that it's a rather slow and not particularly heavily armored beast means that this vehicle should have a limited effect on whatever matchmaking it gets placed in, at least in the long term. Which itself will heavily depend on the choices of ammunition that it gets. Gaijin have stated that it will get the usual assortment of ammo available for NATO 105mm guns, but nothing was specifically mentioned regarding the use of M111 HETS AP FSDS, which is really what will make or break the tank. If it does get AP FSDS, I would likely place it in either 8.3 or an 8.7 battle rating. Any higher than that would result in being outmaneuvered and eaten alive by top tier tanks, and any lower and its potential survivability will be too powerful for lower tiered opponents. However, only time will tell how the vehicle will ultimately perform. So before we wrap this up, I want to know what you guys think of this announcement. Are you looking forward to it? Do you think it will be too much? And what do you think of its implementation into the US tech tree? Leave a comment down below. This has been Many Miles Away, so keep your tracks checked, keep your bottoms in place, keep around on the tube, and I will see you all in the next video. 